this is the red line where we talk to three expert witnesses about one big issue shaping the news both here and overseas. And I'm your host, Michael Elliott. High up in the Arctic Circle is the world's coldest battlefield. One we don't think about a lot, but is a major linchpin for the defenses of Russia, NATO, and the Scandinavians. A potential world flashpoint that right now is completely dominated by just one side. It houses divisions of troops, tanks, icebreakers, Gen 5 fighters, but most importantly, the Russian missile testing facilities, as well as the majority of their missile launch sites. In the Arctic, Russia is rolling out the next phase in nuclear warfare, with its hypersonic and skyfall nuclear programs. Missiles that undo almost 80 years of US naval doctrine, and for the first time in decades pose a real threat to the US mainland. This is a game changer akin to the move from wooden sail ships to steam powered ironclads, and yet very little people seem to be noticing history being written before our eyes. So this week, we take a look into the new Arctic battlefield, why climate change is making it even more important, as well as the Russian and Chinese missile programs, and most importantly, why this could potentially threaten the US naval hegemony in the waters around the globe for decades to come. But to start us off, we turn to our first guest. Part 1. Open for Business. I would say one of them is, of course, the collapse of the Soviet Union, because it's totally changed the cooperation patterns that emerged in the Arctic between Russia and its neighbor, with the creation of the Arctic Council in 1996, and the transformation of the Arctic in a zone for region for international collaboration. It was a quite successful uh, transformation. And then the second big biggest change is, of course, climate change. Because as you know, both the North and the South Pole are very sensitive to climate change. They are the fastest heating regions in the world. They are the most touched by climate change. We have seen dramatic ice melting and permafrost thawing. So of course, it's created a lot of changes in the geopolitical and strategic significance of the Arctic. So I think that the two big changes that we have been noticing over the last 40 years. Marlene Laurel is the director of the Central Asia program at the George Washington University. She's also the director of the European, Russian and Eurasian Studies think tank and the co-director of the Panaros Eurasia Institute. She has also released more than a dozen books about Russia and the Soviet Union in both English, French and Russian. And she joins us today. Oh, well, you know, it's changing uh, season by season, but it has lost at least one third of the the kind of the traditional surface that it has at its uh, uh, peak in in, um, in winter. And then depending on the year, it's sometimes more, sometimes less, but it's really changing very fast, especially since the last few years. The reduction of ice is huge for the geopolitical situation in northern Russia, opening up what's now known as the Northeast Passage. Uh, can you explain what that is? Yes, yeah, so the Northeast Passage is the Arctic route that is following the Russian um, territory. So there is two Arctic roads, right? One uh, on following the, the Canadian territory and one following the, the Russian one. So the Northeast Passage is the one following the, the Russian territory. It's usually called the Northern Sea Routes. And it has been indeed the fastest opening one for climatic regions, so uh, climatic reasons. So since a few years now, we have seen an increase in international and mostly domestic traffic along these northern sea routes, especially during summer months when there they are there is less ice or almost no ice. And so since a few years, the the traffic has been really increasing. There was like three million tons. Uh, trafficking, like tr being transported in 2013. Last year, it was almost 20 million tons, and it will be much more in the first coming year. So it's really growing, and it's especially related to the transport of oil, LNG, minerals, coal. So a lot of uh, uh, minerals and oil and gas are circulating along this, this road. So with this shorter sea route opening up in the north of Russia between East Asia and Europe, that's going to have some big long-term impacts. Uh, 
it's a little while off being cost effective with all the ice up there, but a sea route up there would be a huge change in the power balance of trade routes. It would put one of the world's busiest sea routes almost completely inside Russian territorial waters. How do you think the US would feel knowing that their, you know, their most important goal is freedom of navigation for its warships and trading vessels now relying on Russian territorial waters? Yes, yeah, so that's one of the challenge of one of the geopolitical challenge that especially the US would like to avoid if that's for the moment. Technically, Russia consider or legally, Russia consider that the whole Northern Sea Route is part of its domestic water and therefore try to regulate the, the, the transportation, the circulation, they had several laws in 2012. They had the first law amending the shipping codes, making the, the Northern Sea Route a domestic route. Last year, 2019, they required foreign warships to notify the Russian government that they would be crossing. So they are trying to increase their legislation to be sure they remain in control of the circulation of the road. So the other big thing we're seeing at the moment is Russia reopening all of its old Soviet-era Arctic bases, as well as building some brand new ones along the northern coast, uh, something the US really isn't doing. Uh, why would Russia be spending so much money and effort rebuilding its far north bases and airfields uh, in a time when they're very low on cash? Well, it's not only against, it's not a specifically anti-US policy, it's much more complicated than that why they are rebuilding their Soviet Arctic bases. It's, in fact, it has all these bases have a dual purpose, right? They are, the first one is to re just retake control of Russia's territory. And the second one is remilitarizing the region. But the first one, I think it's a really important one, is that Russia realized that if they really want to be in control of their own territory, they have to rebuild this military Basis because they don't have, it's easier for Russia to deploy military personnel than to train a new generation of kind of civil safety uh, uh, oriented, you know, brigades. So they really use the military as to replace this kind of civil security and safety uh, um, um, say, uh, minister, for example, ministry that we would have in the West. And if you think that the Arctic is opening because of climate change, then it means you need better disaster preparedness. You need to be able to be prepared in case of the development of Arctic tourism. There is, for example, a huge agreement that was signed in 2011 for search and rescue in the Arctic. And Russia is in charge of, well, almost half of these uh, um, search and rescue territories because that's her own territory. They want to do scientific expeditions. So if you just increase human presence in the Arctic, you need to have some basis that will be operational with people well trained and well equipped to function in this kind of harsh climatic environment and in the russian tradition it's the military that will be doing that so that's the first aspect and the second one is that of course russia is interested in trying to remilitarize the in a more classic sense, because of the tension with NATO, it's not only with the US, it's also partly with Norway, and it's globally the spillover of the Ukrainian crisis since 2014 that really kind of pushed Russia to feel that potentially it could be threatened in the Arctic, and therefore they want to kind of showcase their power and their control. And on the Russian side, on the, the Kremlin side, it's really understood as being back to Soviet time normality. So for them, it just a return to what was the Soviet presence in the Arctic in the 70s and 80s. So what a lot of people don't realize is that the Arctic region contains vast quantities of untapped oil and gas, and whoever controls the air would have access to all of it. Uh, can you elaborate a bit on this? Yes, yeah, so the, the, the Arctic is quite rich in oil and gas, but also in several minerals. The problem is to know it's not because it's rich that it can be extractable and it's not because it can be extractable that it can, it's commercially viable, right? So a lot of projects have been on the air, but very few are really taking, are really developed now, especially because if the price of oil is very low as it is now, then Arctic oil is too expensive to extract. So for the moment, it seems that it's mostly gas and especially LNG 
that will be extracted from the Arctic more than oil because oil is, is as I said, the price of oil is not interesting so far for, for developing field in the Arctic. But Russia, for example, has been developing a huge a mega project in the Yamal Peninsula on that will be a mostly an LNG production and that will really contribute to totally reship gas export of Russia, especially toward China. So that's a big part of big big part of Russia's energy strategy in the Arctic. So looking at Russia's northwestern border now, Russia's Arctic region shares a long border with Finland, but more importantly, it also shares a border with Norway, who are a big part of NATO. Is there much tension in the north having NATO bases and airfields so close to a very strategically important area for Moscow? The northern fleet, the Russian northern fleet, is uh, uh, located on the Kola Peninsula, so very close to the Norwegian border. That's where Russia has the majority of its uh, uh, nuclear weapons also uh, uh, located. But but it's not so much that Russia sees Norway as a threat, it's just that Russia is afraid of NATO globally trying to become too visible in a region where Russia considers that it has its own strategic interest because the Northern Fleet is located there, as I said, and the Northern Fleet needs to be able to access the Atlantic Ocean. And the only way for the Russian Northern Fleet to access free water and therefore the Atlantic Ocean is to go above, you know, like around Norway and then in the direction of UK. And that's really the place where you could imagine having a lot of geopolitical tensions if things were continuing to deteriorate between NATO and Russia in the in the future. In that important Arctic waterway we're just talking about is the Svalbard Archipelago, a small group of Arctic islands technically owned by Norway. But there was a treaty signed by the international community giving a peculiar set of laws to these islands. The Svalbard Treaty allows anyone to visit the islands with no visa, and whoever fishes or mines on the island doesn't have to pay tax. This situation has prompted the Russian government to move large numbers of ethnic Russians into the islands to mine coal for the government in Moscow. Why would the Russians be willing to waste millions of dollars to make sure the archipelago is ethnically majority Russian? Yeah, so under the Svalbard Treaty mining codes, every country that is involved in extractive activities on the archipelago has the right to be present, right? So it's a very specific uh, treaty from the early 20th century. And so Russia really considers that it should be able to stay on the archipelago as long as possible. First, they were doing mining during Soviet time. Now this mining um industries is of course not going very well but norway decided to close its mines on its own side russia wants to continue mining in the region not because they really care about their production but because they as i said they want to keep their foot on the 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 island or the archipelago they were also discussing re-examining the old potential of Svalbard because during Soviet time there were several experts who said that maybe there will be oil in the region, in the in the archipelago. So Russia is trying to find any way to stay involved in the region because as I said, it's a key place, it's a key uh, point of access to the Atlantic Ocean and of control of all the Baltic Barren Sea region for Russia. So it's really an element that Russia will probably not stop trying to be involved in in the forthcoming future. And we're going to talk more about the geopolitical ramifications of that with our next guest. But for now, something almost unique to Russia is just how inaccessible a lot of its landscape is. While most Russian cities can be supplied by the Trans-Siberian Railway, very important Russian cities like Norilsk have no real access to the rest of the country, relying completely on icebreakers and naval supplies for the city's survival. With an opening northern sea round, can we expect Russia to have more ability to establish large cities in the Arctic, unlike they could before? Oh yes, absolutely. And you know, during Soviet time, the northern sea route was much more used exactly for these purposes of just logistical, you know, reconnection and economic uh, sending equipment to all these Arctic cities and especially to Norilsk, but not only. So the Northern Sea Route was really much more used during Soviet time. Uh, 
for all these logistical purposes, then it's kind of collapsed in the 90s and 2000. And now the goal of the Russian government is really to be able to reuse it exactly on the, the way it was used during Soviet times to be able to equip once again all these uh, strategic cities. And for example, for Norilsk, it's really the, the main firm there, Norilsk Nickel, has its own ice-breaking, uh, uh, nuclear-powered ice-breaking fleet, so they can themselves uh, uh, not only export their minerals toward Europe or toward Asia, but they can also bring, if needed, equipment from Europe and Russia to Norilsk through this uh, Northern Sea route, which, as you said, allow Norilsk not to be dependent on anything coming from the south because there is no connection with the Trans-Siberian. So China is now classifying itself as a near-Arctic nation, investing millions in Arctic infrastructure in places like Greenland and seeking a place on the Arctic Council. Why would China be trying to insert itself in the Arctic, seeing as it's closer to the equator than it is to the Arctic Circle? Well, you know, China has many stakes in the in in the arctic first they are interesting i think they they have just a, a policy of becoming a great power progressively and having a say even in region where they are not territorially uh, close and that's why china created this narrative about being a near arctic state which of course didn't really convince the the russians but it still has been used by china as a kind of promotion or branding of its role in the Arctic, then China is interested in these new transportation routes because it would like to be able to at least ship part of its mineral requirement via the northern sea route in order not to have to use the southern straits of Hormuz and Malacca, which are further so overloaded and then they are geopolitically quite unstable. And then China is interested in the resources of the Arctic itself, of what Russian Arctic territories can offer. There are also a lot of Chinese firms are now in uh, developing a project in Iceland, in, Gren in, uh, in Greenland. And then you have a general broader kind of science diplomacy that has been launched by China as part of its kind of growing soft power strategy in trying to show that they also can do Arctic science uh, uh, and becoming a, an important actor of this kind of diplomacy, uh, scientific or so, diplomacy or, or soft power. So that's Russia, uh, China has many reasons to be present in, in the Arctic, but of course for many countries that are genuinely Arctic, it's an issue to have such a state arriving in the region. Do you think the Americans are doing enough in the region to counter the Russian expansion? Well, I don't think they are doing a lot, not because they are not worried about the Russian role in the region, but because they are busy on so many other theaters in the world that the Arctic one is not such so important. I think the U.S. is so much overstretched all over the world that the Arctic doesn't really has any room for that, or at least a very minor room so far. I have always subscribed to the Tim Marshall theory that a country's future is mostly decided by its geography. To use a poker metaphor here, someone like the USA was dealt a very good hand, with large river systems, an ocean between them and any great power, and naturally great farmland. Whereas a nation like Russia with almost no warm water ports and stretched out logistics was dealt a fairly mediocre one. Geopolitics, however, is not completely decided by your hand. It's also decided by how will you play that hand. And some countries play very well. Nations like Malaysia and Iran sit at crucial natural maritime choke points with the Straits of Malacca and Hormuz. And both of these nations have huge influence in international trade because of it. If pushed, both of these nations could theoretically close their straits and throw global trade into a panic. So they're treated with some respect, and the people take that into account when making deals with them. Russia would love to have that sort of leverage, and add that card to its hand. If the Northeast Passage were to open up, Russia would have huge amounts of trade coming through its domestic waters. Waters it can dictate who comes in and out of. Waters that right now contain only Russian armed forces. This reality of a bustling northern trade route is still a little while off today. 
due to the price of insurance of Arctic shipping and the amount of ice left in the region. But with each summer heating up, we're bringing that reality closer and closer. And to talk a little more about the geopolitics of that, we turn to our next guest. Part 2. Old Goals for New Times Until 1990, 1991, the Arctic was really um, very important for uh, the Soviet Union and the United States because it was the shortest route for a potential um, missile attack, ballistic missile attack. So there was a lot of, of monitoring of the Arctic to make sure that you didn't have any threat coming from, from above the North Pole, basically. Stephanie Pizard has a PhD in political science from the University of Geneva and a master's in history and international development from the French Institute in Paris. She is also a senior analyst for the RAND Corporation, specializing in Russia and Arctic affairs. And she joins us today. Recession of sea ice also opens new possibilities in terms of resource extraction, um, economic exploitation more broadly of the Arctic region, and, and also makes it more likely that um, um, areas such as the Northern Sea Routes uh, on, on the northern border of, the, of Russia could become a viable shipping route as it has already started to, to be. So one of the most important strategic items in the north of Russia is its missile programs, both offensive and defensive missiles. Uh, can you elaborate a little further on why Russia would base their missile program mostly in the Kola Peninsula, not too far from the Finnish border? So Russia, again, because this is such a strategic area for Russia, um, the, the Russia has this um, sort of bastion um, sort of approach to protecting its territory with uh, large amounts of air defense. Um, but I mean, it's not just air defense, it's defense from air and maritime and, and, and land threats uh, to protect that Kola Peninsula in particular. Um, so there was this, it's called a bubble because um, there is this notion that there is this bubble around Northwestern Russia that protects it and that uh, NATO forces could not penetrate um, because it's very well protected. Um, now the question is how far does a bubble go? There was a concern at some point that the bubble might be going, might be including for instance parts of Norway um, who is a, 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 a NATO ally, um, a NATO, NATO member, so uh, that would make defense of Norway difficult uh, in case Norway was attacked, the bubble would also cover the Baltic um, Baltic states, which are similarly uh, part of NATO. And again, uh, that means that um, other NATO members could not come to the Baltic states' defense if they were attacked. But but there's been some some recent research um, coming in, particularly from FOI in Sweden, that shows that um, the bubble, the size of the bubble, may have been exaggerated and that um, actually um, it's not as performant as was believed to be. So it's, it's a smaller bubble and a more penetrable bubble than was initially thought. Um, so um, this recent report calls for not overestimating Russia's, Russia's defense capabilities. So a question both myself and probably Mr. Putin have is regarding Finland. Uh, Norway is protected by Article 5 of NATO, but Finland isn't part of NATO. If Russia was to actually go in and invade Finland, do you think NATO would defend the Finnish? So that's that's uh, that's uh, that's a pending question. I would say uh, Finland is definitely not uh, a NATO member and um, doesn't seem to be heading that way. I mean, there are some you know constantly changing um, public opinion polls on this opinion, but it, it doesn't seem like anything imminent. Now that being said, Finland has been involved in a number of NATO exercises and activities and is just very, very present and involved. And and Finland and Sweden signed a, a trilateral agreement with the US a couple of years ago, calling for increased defense cooperation. So again, that does not make uh, Finland or Sweden members of NATO, but, but they are closely involved with NATO. Um, so how would uh, NATO members react if Finland and Sweden were attacked? I don't think they would stand on the side saying, sorry, you're not NATO members. There would, there would certainly be a reaction. 
but what would be the degree of that reaction? That I, I don't know, and I think it's anyone's guess. So we discussed a little earlier on in the piece the question of Svalbard. Technically a Norwegian territory with anyone allowed on it except for military personnel. And this has kept the islands fairly peaceful so far. But now with the islands being majority Russian, that could lead to some problems. If a natural disaster or riots or anything of that variety broke out on the islands, Russia may feel justified to send in Russian peacekeepers to save its citizens living there. But this would break the treaty, and we all know once peacekeepers are in, it's sometimes hard to get them to leave. How do you think Norway would respond to this scenario? Well, I mean, technically, I think they could do it. Um, they could pretty much do it, uh, you know, anywhere where where there are Russians. Uh, um, Russia, Russia has been critical of some aspects of the Svalbard Treaty, in particular. Um, they've been they've been critical of Norway's control of the fishing zone around Svalbard, which has led to some small incidents over the years, um, you know, involving the Coast Guard, small scale, but sort of a way of saying, you know, we, we, if we want to fish there, we should be able to go fishing there. Um, now, sending peacekeepers to protect Russians, again, that would be, that would be an extremely risky move because since um, Svalbard is not technically, it's not Norwegian territory, but it's under Norwegian's um, control. Uh, it leaves open the question of Article 5, and Norway has been very adamant that Svalbard is covered by Article 5 and that any aggression, aggression against Svalbard could trigger Article 5. Um, and they are, that's, that's really something that Norway has been obviously pushing forward and and, and has tried also to um, to be very um, careful of the Russian minority on Svalbard, precisely to never be accused of being, um, you know, sort of not a not a proper caretaker of Svalbard. Just south of Svalbard is what is known as the GI UK Gap, the area of ocean between Greenland, Iceland, and the UK. During the Cold War, this was said to be one of the largest naval battle zones as NATO would move to contain the Russians in this gap before the Northern Fleet could break out into the Atlantic and harass targets worldwide. Is the idea of the GI-UK gap still relevant today? It's true that the GI-UK gap has become a big strategic area again because it is this... I mean, it's, it's, it's large, it's not, not a choke point per se, but it's still the way that the Northern Fleet would have to go if it wanted to go um, to the Atlantic, um, and, and NATO has been um, concerned that this this would also be the way that again the Northern Fleet submarines Russian submarines would go if they wanted to, for instance, cut undersea cables or um, you know damage damage transatlantic communications. So um, there's there's definitely more more activity around the GI-UK gap, uh, more surveillance, more monitoring of what's, what's happening. It's, it's, it's a highly strategic area again. So we're talking about Greenland, we also need to talk about China, who's investing huge amounts of money into the Arctic. Why do you think China is so invested in this area of the world? The interesting, um, the, the interest of China in the Arctic has been, it's, it's not something that's, that's really recent. It's been, it's been going on for the past, I would say, 20 years, um, but it's it's been increasing because of well the opening of the Arctic, the fact that the Northern Sea Route might be navigable, maybe the Northwest Passage um, above Canada could also be a new shipping route. Um, there's some interest also because of climate change and the fact that a lot of the major changes that you're going to be seeing everywhere in the world, including in China and which are going to affect China tremendously, are visible right now in the Arctic. The Arctic is sort of the, the canary in the coal mine in a way, and, and, and China has really developed its um, scientific activities in the Arctic. Um, again, that's not terribly new. They've been very present um, with scientific research in the Antarctica for, for a while, for instance. Uh, but that, that interest has um, also... 
sort of increased in terms of economic investment. So they've been they've been um, they've been exploring. So either exploring or extracting in northern Canada, in Greenland. Um, they've been also present and are present in uh, Russia, where they took a big participation in that Yamal um, LNG project that Russia has been developing. And Russia has turned to Russia. To Russia, sorry, has turned to China partly because, um, because of the sanctions since 2014 and the necessity to find new investors. And China has been more than happy to to step in. So you mentioned the Northwest Passage, which is the ice route through northern Canada. Which do you think is more likely to become the major seaway: the Northwest Passage through Canadian waters, or the Northeast Passage through Russian waters? So you would ha you would have to look at different um, ice uh, sea ice recession models to look at how exactly this is going to change. But right now, I mean, the the Northwest Passage is not very navigable north of Canada. Um, and it's not it's 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 not much used. It's used for um, so there was there was a cruise ship um, that that took the passage a couple years ago. There have been some um, shipping to, um, you know, from, from, from mines in northern Canada out for export, but it's, it's not very, very much used. Uh, northern Sea Route, it's not huge either, but it's still more important than the Northwest Passage. Um, and from what I understand, it's just going to, this trend is just going to continue, just going to be um, stronger over time. So the big question, though, is do you think the U.S. will make moves to even up the military imbalance in the Arctic? That, that's, kind of, that's, kind of, that's kind of hard to say. The, the, the current uh, U.S. position is to um, increase its presence, uh, increase its monitoring of the situation, so increasing assets. Again, the Polar Security Cutter Program is, is a way to um, be more present in, in the U.S. Arctic and in the Arctic more broadly. Um, and I think that there is an increased interest in the Arctic that did not exist a few years ago. Um, that started with the Obama administration at the time that the United States um, started became the chair of the Arctic Council in 2015-2017. And then, and then the, the theme sort of disappeared and, and came back up, particularly with Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's um, statement at the um, Arctic uh, Arctic Council um, ministerial meeting last year uh, that really framed the Arctic in terms of strategic competition between the United States and Russia and China and uh, was very um, um, very critical of Russia's assertiveness in the Arctic and very critical of China's claim to be a near Arctic state. So all of a sudden, this put the Arctic back sort of on the on the on the scene for from a U.S. perspective, where it was not that present before. It's no accident the national symbol for Russia is a bear, a polar animal that can take a beating and still stand up, an animal that can go into hibernation when required. Now, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the bear seems to be waking up and reasserting itself on the world stage. And almost nowhere more present than the Arctic. Reopening old bases, restarting airfields, building missile sites, new submarine pens, and rearming itself for a potential fight in the future. But who is this fight with? Well, to find that out, we talk to our next guest. Part 3. Waking the Bear since the Bolsheviks took power in 1917, Russians and Soviets more generally have feared some kind of invasion or attack from the Arctic Circle. Whether that's even conceivable in an age of nuclear weapons, who knows? I doubt it. But they've always seen it from a military strategic point of view, back to 1917-18, when in fact British and American truce, troops uh, settled in Archangel Province, uh, intervened to keep Russia in World War I after uh, the Bolsheviks took power. Paul Josephson, 
is a professor of Russian and Soviet history at Colby College. He specializes in the science and technology of the country and has written a number of books on the subject. And he joins us today. And of course, a secondary reason for such interest in the Arctic is the vast extent of hydrocarbons, oil and gas in particular, but there's also coal up there or in the north. And then you have extensive strategic minerals from uh, platinum to uh, tungsten, copper, nickel, and so on. Uh, there may even be spots of aluminum uh, just below the Arctic Circle. So Russia, a modern resource state, sees all of these things as uh, crucial to its present as Soviet leaders saw it crucial to the present in military and economic fashion. So one of the biggest developments in Russia's northern fleets is the big push to move everything from icebreakers to missiles to become nuclear powered. Can you elaborate a bit on that? As, you, as, as we all know, the, the Soviets were the first to launch an atomic-powered icebreaker, appropriately named the Lenin in 1959. And since that time, uh, Russia or the Soviet Union developed uh, a number of larger and larger icebreakers for its atomic fleet, which is now called Atom Flot, or the Atomic Navy. It's part of uh, Rosatom, the Russian Ministry of Atomic Energy. Uh, there were six major icebreakers at one time, and they've all gotten very uh, decrepit. Uh, they began building new ones in the late Brezhnev period, and only now are those coming online. One is called the Arctica. They're building three new ones that they hope to launch uh, in these years, but they're well behind. The Arctica, the Siberia, and uh, the Ural. And these uh, LK-60, which it means how many megawatts they are, 60 megawatt reactors, are intended to increase uh, the tonnage of freight, uh, the speed of passage through the Russian uh, Arctic, and they have some design features that uh, ostensibly allow them to break ice even in some of the shallow uh, estuaries and deltas of the Siberian rivers. Uh, there are four major Siberian rivers that flow from the south uh, in the Russian landmass into the Arctic Ocean. And uh, the settlement of the uh, deltas has been something going on since the Stalin period. Uh, these icebreakers would be able to open the ice in those regions. So first is icebreakers, and a second thing is floating nuclear power stations. The uh, Russians, uh, formerly the Soviets, had been pushing for atomic powered, uh, uh, floating atomic power stations. Uh, since the 1970s and 80s, and they launched one just last year, the academician Lomonosov. Lomonosov, a very famous Russian uh, scientist from the uh, 18th century, is actually from Archangel region, from the subarctic. And the Lomonosov was launched uh, from Leningrad, the Baltic shipbuilding yards, St. Petersburg, the Baltic shipbuilding yards uh, in the autumn, made its way to Murmansk for fueling of the nuclear fuel and is now headed towards Pevek, which is a part of Chukotka, where it would power uh, the development of oil, gas, gold, and other resources in the far east and far north. So looking into the Russian northern fleet now, how does it compare technologically with, let's say, the U.S. Atlantic Fleet? Uh, the Russian Northern Fleet is quite formidable. And, of course, Russia has shipbuilding yards, for example, in Sivorodvinsk, which is not far from Arkhangelsk. Uh, it was built in the ninth... Sivorodvinsk used to be known as Malatovsk, after Molotov. It was built in the 1930s by slave laborers who toiled there until the 1950s after the death of Stalin when the camps were emptied. But it was still a closed city and it turned over to nuclear shipbuilding, submarines, uh, and now it's doing more commercial stuff as well. They have some ideas about using nuclear power to power uh, oil exploration. I've even seen some drawings of 
underwater nuclear powered uh, oil uh, ga gas tankers, um, submarine gas tankers, nuclear powered, which uh, I find really uh, shocking. Um, in any event, the submarine industry has not uh, decayed entirely and the, the Northern Fleet is still able to and does launch from time to time uh, nuclear submarines. On the other hand, I think that there is a certain amount of aging with the Northern Fleet and not only aging of existing uh, ships and vessels, but also <clears throat> the sites where they refuel, where they have stored spent fuel and other highly uh, radioactive waste from the Soviet period. And only now, since 1911, uh, 2011 and 2012, have, uh, has Russia turned more systematically to cleaning up this extensive uh, waste of uh, jettisoned reactor vessels of submarines that sank during the Soviet period and one during the Putin era and so on and so forth. So it's both formidable, but it faces its own significant problems. With the US announcing it will be starting a space force, are the Russians likely to move in the same direction to compete with Washington? Um, I may be in a minority here, but I've always thought that militarizing space, first of all, is against treaties, and second, will not work. Third, Star Wars technologies have shown themselves to be abject failures. Uh, and it, we know how absurd the effort to militarize space is when President Donald J. Trump decides to have a space force. So you don't think we'll be seeing space rangers before the next election? Uh, I'm certain that the uniforms are lovely. <laughs> Uh, so what are the massive projects we're likely to see in the Arctic over the next few decades? If you look at some of the projects that exist in the Russian Arctic today, for example, uh, the desire of uh, President Putin to see perhaps, in addition to a northern sea route come to fruition with the icebreakers, in 2005 he announced something called Ural Industrial Ural Polar, a new project to guarantee the development of a rich mineral ore resource corridor, that is a railroad that ran through the uh, Arctic Urals. And that railroad has roots in the uh, Stalin period. Uh, Stalin himself commissioned such a, uh, how do we call it, uh, Arctic Trans-Siberian Railroad beginning in 1947. Uh, it failed, but this project has come back. Um, and we see many types of these projects that have uh, Soviet roots, and in some cases even Gulag roots, that are important to the leadership today. Russia is making big moves in the Arctic, with its tanks, its troops, its aircraft. But there's one move we really can't look past the hypersonic and Skyfall missile programs, both of which could shift the balance of power in the world and flip naval doctrine forever. These missiles could make US defenses obsolete, some experts even theorizing that aircraft carriers are now nothing more than huge floating targets, that they could even go the same way the battleship did in the 1940s. These are huge status quo shattering programs, and to talk more about them, we turn to our next guest. Part four, flipping the table. I think what many people are seeing change, I see as a, a just simply a reestablishment. And what that ultimately means is that the combination of the geopolitics strength of the, the United States and Russia, the existence of the core weapon systems that determine the power bases and that is of course are the missile systems that are nuclear tipped and ultimately anything else that has occurred in the international system as a sort of a tension point uh, between these two major um, uh, great powers uh, it is the arctic that is the ultimate determinant uh, 
and the strategic balance between the two states. Rob Hubert is a professor of Naval Studies, International Relations and Strategic Studies at the University of Calgary. When doing the research for this episode, a huge amount of the best papers on this subject as recommended to me by both my Russian and US contacts were all written by Rob. So it's an absolute pleasure to have him on the show and have him join us today. Well, what we are seeing now is, of course, the introduction of what many people are characterizing as hypersonics, but to a certain degree, these are a simple, I won't say simple, but a further development of missile-based delivery systems of your nuclear capabilities. And once again, it comes back to this core issue that when we talk about Russia and United States being the two most uh, powerful states in, that, uh, in the international system, uh, with the arrival of the Chinese, you have to talk about missile delivery systems. And hence, if you can start talking about a delivery system that is even more advanced than what was developed during the Cold War, those are, of course, the, the weapon systems that people are focusing on. So how much of a game changer are these hypersonic missiles? Well, it's, it's going to be that much of a game changer because what it does is it allows the Chinese, because most people, of course, are, 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 are fixated on some of the pronouncements that uh, Putin has made about the Russian um, entry into the hypersonics. But it's the Chinese that seem to be leading the technological capabilities. And this now gives the Chinese an ability to enter into the into the strategic balance and particularly in the Arctic in a way that I think a lot of people weren't thinking. The Russian capabilities of the hypersonics, of course, means that if what Putin is telling us, or even if, if, if some of what Putin is telling us is, is in fact factually based, it means that the Russians have, have basically been able to eat away at what was clearly an American dominance since the end of the Cold War in terms of their strategic weapon capability. So for our audience to get a better understanding, can you explain why hypersonics matter so much and how they're different to, let's say, a standard ICBM? Well, there's, there's, I mean, when we talk about hypersonics, we're actually talking about a whole new type of weapon system. Um, there's, there's different ways of doing it, but you're talking about, in effect, having weapons that are able to go more than five times the speed of sound and do this in the atmosphere. We've had weapons that can go the speeds that we're talking about in terms of your traditional ICBMs and SLBMs that are launched into the outer, basically into outer space, and then come back at speeds that are more than five times the speed of sound. But they follow a very clear trajectory. In other words, you fire the missile up, uh, the missile goes into semi-orbit and it comes down. That's that, you know, the Americans are developing their ABM systems on that certainty of where that orbit comes. What hypersonics give you and why they're a game changer is, of course, you eliminate that certainty. You're able to get those type of speeds and you're able to operate in the atmosphere. And you're also able to give it some maneuverability. You've got basically two types. You've got the one type that is sort of like an ICBM, but the glide vehicle that then comes back into the atmosphere has maneuverability. And that means from an ABM, from an ability to shoot it down, that becomes very problematic. You also have what the Russians and the Chinese seem to be developing is a sort of a cruise missile type delivery system that just simply can go very fast and very maneuverable. Two things that this changes. First of all, it, it very much negates most of the capabilities of an ABM system. You can't simply shoot it down. Second of all, because they are moving so fast, you now have the possibility of basically surprising your enemy. Uh, I mean, where the Chinese started developing their hypersonics was to try to develop a missile that could take out American aircraft carriers. Up until recently, in any issue with Taiwan, it was always thought that if the Chinese tried to use military force to retake Taiwan, the Americans would use their superior naval capabilities centered around their aircraft carriers to, to push the Chinese out. So the Chinese developed the missile, basically these hypersonics that come in so fast that cannot be defeated by the American defensive systems with the idea that if you were to sink an American aircraft carrier, 
or at least have the capability to sink an air, air, American aircraft carrier, the Americans wouldn't then inter, interfere with a, with a Chinese invasion. So it's all about trying to deter the Americans from a response. I think what ended up happening is once the Chinese saw that they could develop that technology, they very clearly saw that it applies beyond the issue surrounding Taiwan. And I think that once it became known what the Chinese were doing, the Russians and Americans became very interested in developing similar weapon systems. The other big missile project is the Russian Skyfall program, a nuclear-powered missile that theoretically can remain in flight for years at a time before it hits its target. Can you elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, well, the Skyfarm, uh, I mean, the interesting thing with that is the, it's alleged that what the Russians are doing, of course, is they're looking at nuclear power to give them the propulsion unit to go that fast. And this is a technology that isn't all that new. The Americans experimented with it around the 1960s and ultimately came to the decision they could make it work or it wasn't worth the effort to make it work. We seem to be seeing some indications that the Russians are, in fact, trying to make this technology work. The advantage of, of nuclear-powered hypersonics is, of course, the range becomes that much greater. I mean, if you've got the capability of getting those type of speeds and the endurance that a nuclear um, uh, fuel system would provide you with, I mean, it's basically a fire that you're not going to be able, you can fire it from Moscow for that matter and hit targets anywhere within the atmosphere internationally. And all of a sudden, that, that gives you a capability that will be very hard to defend against. The pushback on it, of course, is that there have been recent public reports that, in fact, the Russians have suffered some very large-scale failures with, this, with, with the, their, their prototypes. And in fact, there have been allegations coming out of some of the Norwegian press that there have been, there's radioactive fallout within regions where the Russians were testing it in the high north. So with these missiles being too fast for American defenses and having a huge fully stocked aircraft carrier costing upwards of $25 billion with planes on the deck, will this have effects on the viability of using aircraft carriers as the main centerpiece of the U.S. Navy? Well, it definitely changed. I mean, and as I said, this is what they, at least we think this is what the Chinese were thinking when they were originally designing these, was to respond to the aircraft carrier. I mean, this it continues to be a debate in terms of just how vulnerable American carrier uh, battle groups are. I mean, having said that, um, of course, this is the major focus of the American Navy, is how do you protect your, your naval power as it is centered around the, uh, the, the, the carriers. Um, this is where you're getting into the discussion about uh, developing defensive systems where you have this, this interoperability, and this is what the F-35 is supposed to represent, where you're not just talking about the ability of the aircraft to see around itself, but you're tying yourself into a system of system so that you are then focusing on where the Russians or presumably the Chinese would be launching these from. It gets into what's referred to as taking out the archer rather than simply uh, defending against the arrow. Now, what that assumes is, of course, you know where they are being launched from. And when you start seeing some, some of the Russian efforts to develop nuclear propulsion and, and, and some of the, you know, the issues that then says you could launch them from anywhere, you can start to appreciate how vulnerable the, the carriers then become. Now, the Americans are very sensitive to, to this, and of course, a lot of the American most top-level uh, ABM developments, particularly in terms of satellite surveillance and capability of trying to look down and find these, the, these systems as they're being fired, uh, is directed. But it ultimately, we come back to that question. You know, will these these weapons coming in at such a high speed? You wouldn't even have to put that much of a warhead on it because the velocity itself would would basically be the explosive element of the missile. And if ultimately one or, one or two of these missiles can in fact take out the carrier, does that then alter how the Americans use their carriers? And once again, we see this going back to this is the intent that the Chinese wanted to achieve. Are the Russians and Chinese now combined achieving that ability to neutralize the American ability to send their carriers? And this is very much a question that is being debated in, in all circles of, uh, of Russia, American, and uh, Chinese strategic thought. So here at the show, we follow a lot of arms journalists and sellers. And speaking with a few of them over the last few weeks, the biggest change they all seem to be noticing 
a few years ago, they were buying a lot of anti-guerrilla war stuff, you know, equipment you would use to fight battles against the Taliban in Afghanistan or rebels in Chechnya. But more recently, they all seem to be moving back to buying conventional warfare materials, you know, tanks, artillery, rifles, the stuff you would use to fight a great power versus great power war. Do you think there's a reason for this change in buying behavior? Well, absolutely. What we've seen is, of course, is that, and once again, I think the West really didn't pay attention to this, but China, after Tiananmen Square, made the decision to become a great power, not just a regional power. And a lot of, you know, at this point, I mean, in Canada, we had, a, in 1991, we had, a, we had a larger defense budget than the Chinese. And the Chinese have slowly been building up this global capability. And I think that a lot of people, by the time we get into, say, 1960, or 2016, 2014, start realizing that China is not just talking about being a local military capability, but it's looking for a global capability. And that was in, compar in combination with the fact that when the Russians used military force to redraw boundaries in the Crimea, that the realization that the Russians had reemerged as a great power whose interests were not lined with the West, I think that reignited the, the appreciation that geopolitics was defining the relationship between the three countries. I think up until the Ukrainian crisis, there was a, a bit of a mis, misplaced hope that the system itself had changed at the end of the Cold War. I think there were indications as early as 2008, when the Russians used military force to stop Georgia from joining NATO, that it was pretty apparent that we really hadn't left the system of, uh, of the Cold War, and, and basically the Russians had re-caught their breath, so to speak. But the complicating factor is, is the arrival of the Chinese in here. And so as a result, this is now driving where people are spending much less attention on, you know, what is metaphorically used as killing snakes, you know, the whole focus on the terrorist threat that evolved after the attacks of 9-11. And I think that the realization of the arrival of China as a global power and even as a arch growing Arctic interest and the arrival of Russia, a re-arrival of a Russia that is not afraid to use military power against Western interest in 2008, 2014, once again, made people realize that you needed to focus on peer competitors rather than on the, uh, the terrorist threat. So right now, the US assert the right of freedom of navigation to protect any ship in open water. They even run their battle groups through the South China Sea just to prove this. But in the South China Sea, they're surrounded by friendly nations supporting air bases and US island bases. But if the Northeast Passage were to become the dominant waterway, that would be through Russian waters and there'd be far less US airfields and far less US backup in the region. So do you think the US will feel comfortable running a freedom of navigation operation through the Northeast Passage like it does in the South China Sea? Well, they could probably put a battle group up north in the northern uh, Norwegian Sea. Um, they've stood up the second fleet. And if you look at their propaganda, they say, of course, it's just like uh, riding a bike. You never forget how to do it. And they, of course, are doing it with the forward maritime strategy in the end of the 1980s. But if you talk to the individuals that are involved with it, they're saying that they've got a long learning curve to reacquaint how to operate in northern um, ice-infested waters. Um, first and foremost, their, their carrier battle groups um, are thin-hauled. Uh, you're not going to put it where you have any type of ice conditions remaining. So it's got a very limited time that you'd actually put a surface fleet at this point in time. I don't think that they've reacquired all the skill sets yet. Um, I mean, never ever count the Americans out. When they make up their mind, uh, they will learn how to do it again as they, they were able to do it. Now, for their actually sailing through the Northern Sea Route or the Northeast Passage, the, uh, and, and this gets back to your point about the freedom of, op uh, freedom of navigation operations they do in, in the South China Sea. The one rare example, in fact, I'm hard pressed to think of any other example where an American FON was actually stopped, was their effort in 1967 to send three, um, uh, three icebreakers through the, uh, the uh, Northeast Passage. Um, in 67, um, they sent the North Wind, and I think it was the East Wind, and I can't remember the third one, 
to do an FOM through the Northeast Passage, and the Russians met them with a naval um, uh, task force, I think it was two or three destroyers, if memory serves me right, um, and said basically, yes, you can go through, but you have to ask our permission first, because the Russians, very much like Canada, contend that these are internal waters, and therefore you have to ask our permission before you go through. Uh, the Americans said, we're not going to ask permission. The Russians said, well, if you go through, we will fire upon you. In 67, of course, in the greater geopolitical context, the Americans were trying to engage upon detente. The Vietnam War was, was sucking up resources. And so the Americans ultimately made the decision in 67 to tell the three, um, uh, the three um, uh, icebreakers to turn around. And the, the Russians actually were successful in stopping an FON. And so we have that precedent to go by. Therefore, from an international legal perspective, there's no question in my mind the Russians would say, oh, well, this has already been settled. The Russians, you know, the American Navy or Coast Guard Navy has accepted our position, blah, blah, blah. I think that if the Americans were to actually get the capabilities, which is going to be longer term, it's not immediate, to sail surface vessels through the um, uh, Northeast Passage, um, the Russians would probably repeat their actions of 67 and meet them with the, with, the, with the defensive force. And so you have to ask the question, would the Americans at that point be willing to push it and risk a military confrontation with Russia? And I think they, they know this, they've gamed it all out. And I have to ask whether or not they would think that, feel confident enough to be able to do it. So from a technical perspective, from a navigational perspective, can they do it now? No, not, not at this point in time. Can they do it in the medium term? Technically, yes. From a geopolitical, political context, would they be willing to do it? And I can see them, if they could go beyond what is the, 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 the northern sea route, but the problem with that is that pushes them pretty far north into some pretty ice-infested waters. Uh, if they were going to try and stay co closer to the Russian coastline, they'd be within the northern sea route, which is what the Russians call legally the Northeast Passage. Uh, and would they be willing to push the Russians in terms of usage of force? And then that, I'm not quite sure um, if the Americans would think it would be worth the, the risk that they would be invoking. And so I think in the medium term, both from a technical and from a political perspective, the answer is no, the Americans are not going to do it. Now, this is the part as a Canadian that becomes problematic. There were signs that the Americans were thinking about running a freedom of navigation through the Northwest Passage, and the suspicion is they were doing it sort of to make the point with the Russians without risking a confrontation with the Russians. Sort of like, well, if we do it to Canada, obviously then your Northeast Passage is the same. And in fact, former Secretary of the Navy Spencer uh, before he was uh, fired, retired, whatever you quit, whatever you want to uh, say he did, uh, in fact was talking about uh, FONs through the Northwest Passage and Secretary of State Pompey also made a statement about the Northwest Passage. Now that has subsequently stopped. I think somebody pointed out to them that in fact if the Americans were trying to do that to make a point with the Russians, they actually would be doing the opposite because if they actually did in fact make the Northwest Passage into an inter international strait, then Russian submarines and aircraft have the right of transit through the Northwest Passage. And I think they realized that there was not an automatic link between the Northwest Passage and the Northeast Passage. So, you know, from a, from a Canadian, Russian, and a, a Russian-American perspective, this is going to be an issue that will develop in the longer term, but I think probably for the next year or so is going to remain relatively uh, below political attention. So here's my last question. What do you think will be the biggest catalyst for the worsening of the U.S.-Russia relations over the next decade or so? It's the entry of the Chinese. Uh, I mean, everybody assumes right now that the Chinese and the Russians are in lockstep. And I think in many aspects from a strategic perspective in the long term, the Chinese are going to be as much of a threat to Russia as they are to as much as China is to the United States. In other words, we're entering into a geopolitical system where we have three great powers who are not allies to each other that each have very different um, uh, interests and have very different capabilities. We haven't seen this situation. I mean, we're used to bipolar systems where it's Russia or Germany against Britain, 
um, uh, Russia or Soviet Union against the United States. And the idea of actually having a triad rather than a bilateral system uh, um, really complicates the understanding. So you have these weapon systems that are undefendable. We, of course, have a, you know, the thing we haven't talked about, and it, I think it has to be stated right out, all of the great powers are reinvigorating their nuclear capabilities, and they are all developing nuclear war fighting strategies. The Americans are the most public about it with the, with the announcement that they're going back to tactical nuclear weapons on their submarines. Um, but the Russians and the Chinese are thinking of that. I think the big change is that we have three and we have a, a, a greater willingness that I've seen probably since the worst days of the Cold War to actually start thinking about the possibility of at least a limited nuclear global war. And I mean, it's a terrifying prospect because it complicates the, the, the necessary balancing that occurs. And I think that we're going to think back to the, the 2010s and, and as the good old days when things were so much simpler. We are entering a new era, a changing time, a world with three great powers, all of which have very opposing long-term goals. A world where the greatest weapon of the 20th century, the aircraft carrier, could now be nothing more than a big, expensive target. Russia and China seem to be looking further down the road, setting up positions for a conflict decades away, while the US focuses on small Middle East fights. The Arctic is the biggest example of this. Time is marching on. The ice caps are receding, and if nothing changes, the ballpark will move right into the Russian backyard. A backyard they have been preparing for decades now. As people cling to aircraft carriers and F-35s, they need to start realizing that war is changing. It's moving online, to social media, to cyber warfare. It's creating missiles that cost a few million to take out an aircraft carrier that costs billions. It's using private militaries to invade other nations, so the line is so blurred you can't trigger those mutual defense treaties we've been relying on for years. It's moving the trade routes to an area where only one player has a support network, and you would have to say let alone. Future warfare in many ways is already here. The die is cast. The question now, what is the cost of inaction? Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. Our last episode on private militaries was a very big one for us, as we watched our stream count cross 100,000. This meant the world to us. From the bottom of my heart, we thank each and every one of you who shared the show, has been a guest, or even just popped in for a quick listen. We could never have thought that it would take less than six months to cross this threshold. So once again, thank you. If you want to help the show even further, you can donate to the show on Patreon, and just a couple of bucks a month helps us create even better content each and every fortnight. If you want to follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook, you can find us on at the Red Line Pod. Or if you want to follow myself, at Mike Hilliard Oz. Last week, I told you guys to feel free to message me at any point if you want to chat about anything in these crazy times. And quite a number of you did. It was so great meeting a whole bunch of people over the week, and I extend that offer again. If you want to chat, you ask me a question, clarify something on an episode, or need help with a university assignment, or are even just trying to break the boredom of quarantine, please feel free to DM my Twitter at any point. I'd always up for a chat. I also want to thank all of our amazing guests for this episode as well. Marlene Laurel has a website, MarleneLaurel.com, where you can purchase any number of amazing books in both English, Russian, or French. I would highly recommend checking out a paper published by the French Institute of International Relations on Russia's Arctic policy. If you would like an English language copy of this, please feel free to either email Marlene or The Red Line Pod at our website www.theredlinepodcast.com. Stephanie Pizard can be found on Twitter at Stephanie Pizard, and you can visit the Rand Corporation's website for a link to some of her great papers. Paul Josephson is about to release an amazing book titled Putin's Projects, all about how Putin is embracing large-scale projects to push Russia forward over the next 40 years. It was great to have him on the show, and we'll definitely be checking out that book when it comes out. Rob Hubert was amazing to be able to get on the program. He was great to work with, 
and I'm happy to say that we'll be working together again on future projects. Rob's papers on this subject and the Russian military capabilities are highly regarded and would urge you to check them all out. We were thrilled to have him on the program and can't thank him enough. Once again, another big thanks for Mark Spencer for the additional vocals on this episode. Mark is incredibly busy working on shows like The Juice Media and Climactic and we're just so grateful he still takes the time out of his busy schedule to continue to be part of this one. So once again, Mark, thank you. To everyone still listening, please take care of yourselves. Stay safe, love your families, and call a friend who you think may need some connection in these odd times. Quarantines don't last forever, but some friendships do. Thanks again for checking us out, and we'll be back in a fortnight with another international episode. But until then, good night.